So, uh, Seth Hipple from uh, Martin Hipple, the law offices thereof. Um, uh, fairly significant uh, ruling just handed down yesterday. Um, you want to uh, give a brief uh, synopsis of the case and, and uh, what just happened? Sure. So the case, as you know, Bill, started out uh, based on a tra there was a traffic stop and uh, you made a call to Libertarian Answering Services known as Porcupine 411 and during this call the uh, voice of the officer that you that, that had pulled you over was captured on this recording and automatically posted on the uh, Porcupine 411 website sent to uh, the subscribers. Um, at one point Officer Mon Pleasure of the Ware Police Department who had pulled you over said you know, are you recording me? You need my permission to record and um, you responded that no that's not how it works um, Officer Mont Pleasure is a public employee. He, uh, what he does is not private, so he doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, and therefore what he says is not oral communication under the wiretapping law. He even offered to look up the statute, he, he declined. Um, said, we'll let it be, actually, which seemed to indicate to me when I listened to the recording that he was consenting to the recording. Seven months later, uh, came, they came to your house and arrested you on a warrant for uh, felony wiretapping. Um, the of course, I mean, wiretapping law was not meant to shield public employees from from scrutiny by the uh, by the public, but uh, certain departments, where specifically in the last 18 months, have been using it to try to get people not to record them, not to document what they're doing, and this was the latest example. What made this case unique is that usually what happens is the police departments will seize the camera, sometimes erase the footage, and then they drop the charges so that they never have to answer what they for what they did because you know there's no pending court case. Uh, however, in this case, this is the first one that I'm aware of that's actually gone in front of a judge. I'm not aware of any other cases recently that have actually gone in front of a judge. And we filed a motion to dismiss. Um, the, we made a few arguments, but the argument that's really relevant here is we made an argument based on the First Amendment that the um, First Amendment protects the right of freedom of the press. That right doesn't only apply to professional reporters. It applies to average, everyday citizens and uh, independent reporters as well. And the right to freedom of the press includes gathering information. What else is the press if not gathering information about public matters of public interest, such as how a police officer conducts his job? And that was one of the arguments that we made. That was the argument that the uh, that the judge relied on in his order that came down a few days ago. And so, how do you how do you expect this uh, to affect New Hampshire jurisprudence going forward? And how do you think that it should if those two things are different? Well, what the order says, to be clear, is that it says, uh, it cites a recent First Circuit opinion, federal case, that was uh, similar circumstances, and in that case, the Glick v. Conniff case, the First Circuit Court said, it's well established in the circuit that you can record police officers, it's protected by the First Amendment, you can't criminally punish someone for doing it. And uh, the court relied on that heavily in order to say, yes, this is protected by the First Amendment. As I said, this is the first court in New Hampshire to ever make an order about wiretapping public servants related to the First Amendment. And it said it's protected by the First Amendment. So while it's a district court opinion, so it's not actually binding on any courts, it is persuasive in that it's the first time a New Hampshire judge has looked at this, this issue and has agreed with the vast majority of other courts that have looked at at this issue across the country, federal and state, and said, yes, this is protected, constitutionally protected activity. And so it's persuasive. It means that um, other cases will be, uh, it's whenever a police department arrests someone for this and maybe drops the charges, maybe doesn't, they're on notice now that it, there's at least one judge in this state that says this is unconstitutional what you're doing. And I think that makes a difference. It makes a difference for defendants. Any defendant that ever gets arrested in the future and charged with wiretapping under similar circumstances, his attorney is going to use this order. Um, it makes a difference for civil litigants that want to sue police departments when, for violations of their rights, because uh, it's yet another opinion, this time applying this, you know, from the state perspective rather than the federal. That yes, this is a, this is a violation of people's rights to to arrest them for recording police officers. So I think it's significant in that way. Hey, mom, look at me. I'm a president. <laughs> so, and do you, um, do you think that it uh, it it is certain to be that persuasive, or is this possibly 
a battle that's still going to have to continue to be fought. Well, let me clarify what I mean by persuasive precedent. There's two types of precedent, binding and persuasive. Um, the, for instance, the New Hampshire Supreme Court is binding on the New Hampshire District Courts, um, whereas, say, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which was one of the cases I cited was from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, is not binding on the New Hampshire District Court, but it was persuasive in that a judge is going to look at this and say, well, other judges thought this. You know, the idea in our jurisprudence is that we're not supposed to have wildly different outcomes. So if one judge thought this way, the judge, another judge doesn't have to follow it, but you might be persuaded by it. And that's what I mean by persuasive. How persuasive is it? Well, it's based on other precedent, mainly from the First Circuit and from other circuits. Um, so I, I think it's very persuasive for our, for our position in that way. But, you know, how, how much of this battle remains to be fought? Well, that depends on how, how many police departments want to fight this battle. There's very few police departments that have actually decided that they want to, to be in the bullseye of violating people's First Amendment rights. Most of them don't want to do this because it's not, it's not, doesn't work well for them. So that's really, I think, the main victory is going to be that more police departments are going to be hesitant about violating people's First Amendment rights in this way. But no, if you go to another district court, um, you know, you're going to have to litigate the issue all over again. And uh, unless there's a Supreme Court battle here, there won't, be, um, there won't be binding precedent on this in New Hampshire from a state court and, until it gets to the Supreme Court, if it ever does get that far. I would think it won't get that far because I think it's kind of obvious, but, you know, that's me. Yeah, yeah. Well, Attorney Seth Heppel, uh, from uh, the perspective of liberty, thank you very much. And uh, for myself specifically, thank no you very much. Thank you.